Our last case this afternoon is a matter of Odunbaku. Am I pronouncing that right, Counselor? Odunbaku, yes, sir. Odunbaku, thank you. Mr. Palmari? Thank you, Your Honor. I'm Joseph Palmore here on behalf of Ms. Odunbaku. Uh, with the Court's permission, I'd like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal. You have it, sir. The result in this case is dictated by this Court's decision in Bianca v. Frank. Bianca held that when a time period for challenging a decision is measured from service of that decision on a party, and that party is represented, that the time period begins when service occurs on counsel. In this case, Ms. Odumbaku's counsel never was served with a copy of the order. Therefore, her objections were timely. The statute here is identical in all material respects to the statute in Bianca. In Bianca, which, govern, which involved challenges to a personnel action taken against a police officer, the statute required challenges or objections to that decision to be filed within 30 days of service of the order on the member of the force. Bianca, citing universal, consistent practice and basic procedural norms in court litigation where lawyers work as the agent for their, for, uh, their clients, held that this generic phrase, member of the force, like the generic phrase party, meant counsel for the party, and held that that's when the clock started running, not when the order in that case was served on the police officer himself. Is the himself. family court uh, exempt from this particular case? There, you know, there are certain different rules for family court than there are under the CPLR and other rules. So it was, it's, are, are your, your position is that the family court clerk misread the statute? Is that it? Yes, Your Honor. So what Bianca embodies is a rule of construction. It instructs mm -hmm. courts and litigants how to interpret timing statutes. And the timing statute here, which is Section 439E of the Family Court Act, of course, Bianca doesn't address 439B, right? You mean, I'm sorry, you mean the court rule? Right. 20536B? No, it doesn't. And I think that's an important question because that goes to the heart of what respondent argues. So to take a step back and provide the legal framing, what Bianca says is there's a general rule that time periods run from service on counsel. That's why litigants have lawyers. And the lawyer works as the agent for the party. Bianca went on to say there may be circumstances for some idiosyncratic reason why the legislature wants to override that normal rule, but when it wants to do so, it must do so with unmistakable clarity. It, Bianca adopted a clear statement test. So when we look at Section 439E, nothing in Section 439E, which is the timing statute at issue here, even remotely satisfies that clear statement test. In fact, it's written in exactly the same way that the timing statute in Bianca itself was written. It measures the time period from service on the party. And in fact, I would suggest that the application of Bianca here is even, uh, the case for application of Bianca here is even more powerful than it was in Bianca itself, because this statute was adopted after Bianca. So the court, the legislature can be charged with knowledge of the Bianca rule, charged with knowledge of that when it uses the word party generically, that is going to mean counsel for a represented party. Now, now, respondent argues, and this gets to your honor's question, that this family court rule, which directs a, the clerk of court to provide a copy of a decision to a party or counsel, somehow overrides uh, the plain reading of 439E in light of Bianca. And I think that argument fails for multiple independent reasons. First of all, this is a timing case. The timing rules are provided by section 439E. That's really the beginning and the end of the inquiry. Bianca tells us how to read 439E, and Bianca says that the generic reference to party in 439E means a represented party's counsel. This rule is, is not, has nothing to do with the filing of objections or the timing for the filing of objections or when the clock ru runs. It's simply a directive to the clerk. So it exists for a different purpose. I don't think it's relevant to the inquiry. Let me ask this. Do we need to address, the, I think your second point was a due process point. Can't the court address this under Bianca without addressing the due process point? Absolutely. I think that the, the how, how so? Because Bianca adopts, as a matter of New York law, putting aside the Constitution, adopts a rule of construction for timing statutes so, like so this So we one. don't need to engage in a due process analysis to get there? You don't. We think the due process point is additive and gets you to the same place, that. but you don't yeah. need to address it. 
The second reason why the family court rule is an opposite here is because even if it were somehow relevant to the inquiry or were incorporated by reference, it itself would have to satisfy the Bianca clear statement standard, and, and it doesn't. That rule is best read to mean that when a party is pro se, an order will be sent to the pro se party. When a party has counsel, the order will be sent to counsel. That is the most natural reading. That's the one that's consistent with way, the way that courts and litigants in court typically act, which is that official communications go through counsel for a represented party. And to the extent there were any ambiguity on that reading, Bianca would require that the ambiguity be resolved in favor of the reading that requires service on counsel. Finally, a mere court rule can't trump the statute. <coughs> the statute, again, is 439E. It was adopted by the legislature. It was adopted by the legislature after Bianca, and it provides the timing rule here. So nothing in this court rule, even if it were <coughs> relevant and even if it were contradictory, which it isn't, could trump the clear intent of the legislature to require service on counsel in order to start the clock running. You, had, also you had made reference also, I thought, uh, 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 to 213B of the CPLR. Uh, uh, 2103B. Uh, 20, I'm sorry, My, I missed it. Right. It's 20, 2103. Yes, and that was cited in Bianca as an example. So what Bianca said was uh, that this practice of serving lawyers is not simply a matter of courtesy and fairness. It is the traditional and accepted practice which has been all but universally codified. <coughs> and the court cited 2103B, which of course requires service on counsel when we file a motion in, in court. That's just a normal rule. Bianca didn't come out of the blue. I don't read it as an innovation. It's consistent with the settled practice that lawyers follow all the time and that courts follow all the time, but w wasn't followed here. And there are really powerful policy reasons as well for applying and, and uh, reaffirming the rule of there, there was a fourth department case, wasn't there, that uh, uh, from uh, Oneida County? That, uh, are you familiar with that? Uh, there was some discussion of this in the, in, the, in the appellate division's decision. Is this what you're referring yes. to? Yes. Yeah, the, so the, the, or the, the family court's decision. But it, what, what's re remarkable, of course, is that this, 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 it's Bianca that controls here. It's a decision of this court. The, we briefed it extensively before the appellate division, and the appellate division didn't cite it, much less explain. Well, I'm thinking of it's Oneida D Department of Social Services versus Heard. It's a fourth department case from 2002, and the eminent Justice Piggott was the presiding justice in that panel then. And that case, um, I think, addressed <laughs> this issue directly. Um, it's the only case I was able to find in 439, and it seemed to favor your position. Um, the 2103 applies here, uh, and if, if when we say party, we mean represented by counsel. I just bring the attention to everybody so, so that you know about it. Uh, right, well, tw and, right, and 2103, of course, is directed to counsel and service of, of, of right. papers that counsel files, and it requires, of course, those papers to go to counsel for the adversary, adversarial party. And then the rule we're advocating for and that Bianca adopt would require the same thing of the courts. And when a decision is issued, um, it should go to the lawyer, not, not just to the represented party. And the, as the amicus brief explains, and if I have time and rebuttal, I'll discuss, there are really powerful policy reasons for adhering to that rule. People have lawyers for a reason, to safeguard their interests, to, to uh, monitor court proceedings and inform them of what's going on. And the rule of the lower courts really flips that dynamic and requires the client to inform the lawyer of what's going on in court. So one other question, counsel. Was family court required to reject these objections? It could have granted the, what was it, the minimus extension, six days? Was it six days? A absolutely, and that's our backup argument, that even if the, if the objections were untimely, which we don't think they were, the, the family court clearly had authority to allow the untimely filing. Did you raise that in the CPLR, I think, 2004, down in the lower, in family court? We didn't file a motion, Your Honor, but the family court addressed the issue because the family court said, there is no authority to extend this deadline. So it was decided by the family court. Then but we you didn't bring 2000. No, we didn't. Our position there was the same as our principal submission here, was that it wasn't untimely. And then we did brief it in the appellate division, um, and respondent didn't object to it as waived in the appellate division. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Ms. Singh, welcome. May it please the court, good afternoon. My name is Cindy Singh, and with me as co-counsel is Philip Siegel. We're here representing Mr. Geni Odenbaku. 
Your Honors. So what, what's the goal that's served by, <laughs> sorry about that, what, what's the goal that's furthered, let's put it that way, by uh, agreeing with this argument that uh, a service can be on the party as opposed to on a represented party's lawyer in accordance with, with the rule? Okay, I'd like to say three things in response. First okay. and foremost, um, reading the rule and the, the court rule and the statute at issue here in accordance with their plain meaning is compelled. Let's forget that. You're saying that this court could have served your client and not you, and that would have been perfectly fine with you. That's correct. Are you serious? You, yes. You, you representing somebody wants the court to have an ex parte communication with your client uh, without you knowing it, saying this is what the order reads. Well, Your Honor, respectfully, um, I do believe that that is correct because the court rule here at issue. So why should why sh why sh why would they serve one lawyer and not another lawyer, or say uh, we're not we don't like lawyer? You know, look, these lawyers get in the way. All we've got to do is serve the parties. And then whatever happens after that, you know, we can save a lot of time because half of them may not, you know, get to their lawyer in time to, to file objections, uh, and that takes care of that case. And this is great. If this had happened the other way, if your client had not been served and she had been, wouldn't you be wanting to make the argument over here that, you know, judge, you gave, you gave, the, or you gave the order to my client. He was out of town. He, he wasn't even around for a month. He comes back, here's this order he's got to comply with, and I didn't know anything about it. So I want you to give me a break and let me, and they say, no, you know, we have a right to serve your client without you knowing it. Does that make sense um, to you? Respectfully, Your Honor, I'd like to say two things in response. The first is that the statute and the court rule. Does that make sense to you? Well, you're, well in the example that you're providing, yeah. right? You're providing that party is served, one party is served, or and the attorney is served in the other, or both parties are served? Pick your poison. What I'm saying oh. is that the lawyer is not served, and the party who is purported to be served by mail or whatever is out of town uh, is... Uh, it, it is acceptable, Your Honor, because the court what? rule... It is acceptable, Your Honor, because the That's court... fine with you. Because the court rule and the statute impose an obligation on the litigant to transmit the order to his or her attorney. I, I don't know how your practice has been. I've had some pretty you know, some clients that just aren't that swift. I've had clients that don't speak the language that I speak. Uh, I'm representing them in, uh, let's say, family court, and they want to know what's going on through me. And so, and so I, you know, I try to tell them. They then go home. They go wherever they go. And I'm waiting for the court to make a decision, and then I find out the decision was 30 days ago, uh, and it was given to my client who was out of town or didn't, you know, didn't understand it, and, and, and we're out of court? Well, Your Honor, I'd like to say, um, first of all, that the, this case has to be decided on the facts at hand. In the hypothetical that you present, nothing prevents the attorney from following up with the court directly. But I'd like to take from a doing minute what? Um, from following up with the court directly on the status of the decision. But I'd like to call the court's attention right now. Does the to attorney know when to do that every day, every week, every month? You know, ha because some courts, decisions come out right away. Other courts, it may be two, three, four, five, six months or, or longer. So for every client that the attorney has, the attorney has to make sure that he or she knows exactly what's going on from the court in, in, in every single case. Do you think that that's what family court wants, is to be inundated with those phone calls every day? Well, Your Honor, respectfully, there are compelling countervailing policy considerations that support the statute and court rule as written. Okay, and well, that's what I was asking what about. Are. That's where I started. Okay. What is the goal <laughs> that's... Well, the first is the efficient processing of cases. Family court is overwhelmed by the number of support cases. That Lawyers they have. get in the way, don't they? They do. <laughs> How's that? Don't don't you have to? Doesn't the family court have to keep track of who's appeared in a case? Absolutely, but in fact, sometimes the family court judge is assigning the lawyer, right? Yes, but Your Honor, you have to consider the reality and the statistics show that the majority, the overwhelming majority of litigants in support cases are unrepresented. Yeah, that makes no sense. To, Why is it more difficult to send a letter to the attorney than it is to the client? The court record tells you who everybody is and who's appeared. So when they go to send an order, they have to say, okay, who should I send this order to? Oh, she's represented by X. 
The order has to go to X. It's, it's, not, as simple, simple. it's not as simple as, as it may appear because as the statistics indicate of the minority who are represented, counsel only represent them for a part of the proceeding. So but, the but time the final indicate, I mean, if there's an attorney of record and, and that attorney is no longer representing the client, then it's the client's obligation or the attorney's obligation to notify the court that that attorney is no longer represented. So if, if the court mistakenly sends it to the client because the attorney's no longer representing, well, that's, you know, that, that's not the court's fault. But if the record shows an attorney is representing the client, what is so but different? The record may not always show that. There may be multiple that's, notices that's of true. fair and But and what you're saying is, even though we know there's a lawyer in this case, we can decide we're not sending that lawyer the order that, that affects his, his or her client. Yes, under the plain meaning because of the statute. Because we don't like that lawyer. That lawyer is obnoxious. We, we don't like legal aid, so we're not going to send any lawyers to legal aid. We're going to send them to their clients. You know, I just would like to point out the countervailing um, reason, the countervailing policy consideration here, and the countervailing policy is you have to consider that because the reality is the counsel are cycling in and out of cases, serving an attorney may not actually yield well, notice about the to the reality client. counsel of for example, people who are victims of domestic violence having to move a lot, and they may have one address when they appeared in a proceeding, and then two or three addresses by the time they get that order, and it never gets to them, or gets to them 40 days after it was originally sent. What about that okay, reality? To, to um, address Your Honor's question, I'd like to really say two things in response. First. The first thing is, if there is an incidence of domestic violence, okay, and the council is aware of that, a request can be made that service be made specifically on the council. That can be made, but that requires an application and both sides need to be heard. And I, second, the second thing- Hold I'm, it, hold it, hold it. You're saying if I represent somebody who's a victim of domestic violence, I have to make an application to the court on notice to you that I want to be served with, with whatever process the court has? Under the existing statute and court rule, yes. Oh, okay. However, That's clear. this court may not override the legislature and the administrative board um, via their decision. This well, court can this invite. From, how is this different from Bianca? Mm -hmm. You're saying that what, what we held in Bianca. Absolutely. It's not yeah. applicable. Here. It's not applicable Absolutely. to any case because the legislature said no, otherwise. It, when the legislature says otherwise, yes, then the well, rule But how is this different from the language in Bianca? Because, Your Honor, you have to remember that Family Court 439E sits in a distinct statutory scheme, the Family Court Act. The well, you Family said, you Court said Act. In, you say in your brief, the Family Court Service of the Support of Magistrates final orders directly on, on uh, Ms. Odumbaku complied with this court's decision in Bianca. Yes, because it falls under the exception. You said it doesn't apply. No, but it falls under the exception. The holding in Bianca, if we, if we want to parse out the Bianca decision, the holding the statute interpreted there required service. Bianca's exception, which you can argue is dicta, says that the service is not required where the legislature directs otherwise. Here, See, the can legislature- I, Can I just stop you, though, just for one second? Because it, it seems to me there's a fundamental misunderstanding about what the purpose of the legal profession is in this context. You have people that I'd say generally they have a lack of education. Many times they're illiterate. Some of them can't read at all. They, let, they don't understand the meaning of any legal documents. And, and you're asking us to promulgate a rule that says that you have this person who, tell, who knows how to do all these things for you, but we're not going to tell that person. We're going to tell you. And it's your responsibility then to make sure that that person meets every obligation that they have to. This policy makes no sense that you're advocating from a county point of view. I don't see a burden because we're only talking at the most. The most numbers I've seen are maybe 17% of the family court cases are actually people that are represented by counsel. And where they are, they probably get a more accurate outcome in terms of a judiciability. It, it, on, on the fundamental level, this makes absolutely no sense. You know, Your Honor, I'd like to call the court's attention to page 80 of the record, footnote 1, mm -hmm. and in addition, uh, page 108 of the record, uh, paragraphs 1 and 2. I'd like to remind the court that this case must be decided on the facts presently at hand. Absolutely. Here, we, and I think we totally agree with you there, but still, we make law for the whole state, and, and so, so it, it, naturally we're concerned about these things, and that's why I want you to address them. I do, and I would like to point out, again, on page 80 of the record, Ms. Odenbaku concedes that she timely received the orders in question. She then <coughs> timely communicated her receipt of these orders to her attorneys on or before August 5th, 2013, weeks before the statutory deadline. So the procedure, 
of serving either the parties to the proceeding or their attorneys works in this case. If well, uh, see, I get your argument as an alternative argument, saying, you know, even if they should have served the lawyer, in this case it doesn't, it doesn't make any difference. But to say that lawyers don't count, to say you can hire a lawyer, you can pay a lawyer, you can have a lawyer assigned to you, you can meet with that lawyer, you can prepare, you can go to a trial, and that lawyer doesn't count in the eyes of the court, is just antithetical to anybody that's been admitted to the bar. Your Honor, that's not what the statute is saying. Simply by imposing an obligation on a litigant that he or she has to transmit the final orders to her attorney doesn't discount or somehow devalue it the services of an attorney. says they have the choice. Attorney. They can either serve, serve the, the, the party or the lawyer. Yes. Well, what that means is if there's a lawyer, you serve the lawyer. If there isn't, you serve the party. Well, it's that's not, not what the rule says. I suggest to you that maybe that's the definition that it ought to be. I mean, the, the, that's for the legislature or the administrative board to change or prospectively. Or anyone who interprets it with any... Well, this court may not override the legislature via judicial legislation. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that thought. Counsel, as a, as a matter of practice, how widespread is the following of this rule? The, Would, the service on, on the client, regardless of the fact that they may be represented. How widespread is that? I don't have any statistics on that. But I would submit that this procedure works. It works in this case. That Ms. Odenbaco's objections were filed untimely has nothing to do with a faulty interpretation of the statute. And again, the, com the two compelling countervailing policy reasons here. One, to lessen the financial and administrative burden on the family courts, which are already overwhelmed by can the we, number can of we just cases. Can we just ban lawyers? Would that be a better way of doing it? Then we don't have to worry about them at all. No, there, should, there should be lawyers. I mean, lawyers provide well, effective no, let, representation. Let, let's suggest this. You say it's an, it's an either or thing. Can the, can the administrative judge of the family court say you, you, to the clerk, you know where it says either or? That means to the, to the party, never, never to the lawyer. Yes. They would have that opportunity and option, right? Yes, and I would suggest that if you take a look at the statute and court rule, which must be read in conjunction pursuant to Family Court 165A, you'll see that it's not a generic direction. The court rule says that the final order shall be served on either the parties to the proceeding or their attorneys. So yes, the legislature has contemplated and in no way can't is that, devaluating. Can't that, can't that be read to mean, you know, served on the party or in the event that they have a lawyer on the lawyer? No, because that's not a, the plain language interpretation Although of the I, rule. I, just would, I know you've been trying to explain to us what the burden is on the family court yes. of serving the lawyer instead of the party. And frankly, I just have to admit, I'm not getting it. So could you just tell us again what the Thank burden you. is? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Judge Savage Salam. First, there's two, main, there's two main compelling countervailing policy reasons. First, the burden on the family court. You have to understand that when we're looking at the litigants who are represented, the majority only have counsel for a part of the proceeding. Thus, when the clerk is ready to mail out the final orders, they may not know if the litigants actually still represent it. Just allow me to finish. Additionally, when you think about the fact that these, these cases take years to try to completion, there may be multiple attorneys in the file, and not every attorney in family court files a notice of substitution. Sometimes they withdraw on the record, and so there may not even be a notice of substitution in the file. There may be multiple notices of substitution. Cumulatively, this poses an administrative and financial burden on family courts, which are already overwhelmed. Well, Second. they only send out one letter, don't they? I mean, if they send it to the attorney that's no longer on the file. Or, Judge, Salam, or Judge that, Abdus Salam, what if there's seven attorneys in the file? Well, wouldn't it be the last one? What if an attorney has withdrawn on the record? And well, it's then not if the letter goes noted. to that attorney, then that attorney, wouldn't that attorney then go to the court and say, I'm sorry, you're mistaken. I withdrew on the record, and your, your file obviously doesn't reflect that. This needs to go either to the, the next attorney, if there is one, and if you don't, have, don't know that there is one, then it goes to the client. But Judge Stein, I would ask you to consider the implications of what you just said. Think about it. If the, all the while, the 35 days are running, and the litigant is being prejudiced because he or she doesn't know that she's received an order. Well, not if it's required to be served on the attorney. If you serve well, it on the wrong attorney, Judge let Stein's me finish. You haven't served it. And, and this is a problem that criminal courts deal with all the time. There are many substitution of counsel. It happens all the time. And they've worked out systems to deal with. And the systems haven't ground to a court. And, they, and they've met all their deadlines. Um, so it, it's, 
I'm having a hard time understanding your argument too, but thank you. Well, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Singh. Mr. Belmore. Opposing counsel, I thought, had a good point on, on uh, the facts of the record. Want to address them? I'd love to, I'd love to address that, Your Honor. First of all, this is a, a statutory construction case, so the meaning of the statute doesn't vary depending on the circumstances of any individual litigant. Mm -hmm. So that's point one. Point two is that if you look at A108, counsel says that after finding out about the orders, counsel had to make repeated trips to the clerk's office just to try to get copies of them. On August 5th, counsel went. On August 6th, counsel went. Wasn't able to get all the orders until December, months after all of this happened. And were the correct uh, findings of fact and orders all sent to the, the litigant? Yes. To your client? Uh, yes, I believe they were all sent to, okay. all sent to her. Um, but as the court has recognized, there are really powerful policy reasons for reaffirming. Is this a, is this a widespread practice? If you, I, no, I don't think it is, Your Honor. If you look at the amicus brief, uh, which is filed by, on behalf of a number of legal services organizations, they say that the family courts in the other boroughs of New York City send uh, these f orders to attorneys. They may send them to both if there's, a, if there's some confusion or question, but they send them to attorneys. So this is not burdensome. This is the way that courts in other boroughs do this, um, and it doesn't impose any added burden to follow the normal rule of just sending court orders to attorneys. Um, and as the court has recognized, it's particularly in family court, this is very important. And this court has made, and the state has made access to justice a critical priority. And we're talking about a largely low income client base. There may be, they may not have a fixed address. They may have fled a home because of abuse. They may, like Ms. Odumbaku, use a post office box because they don't want to disclose their physical address in court, yet they may not be able to check the post office box very frequently. That they may not, they may have literacy challenges. They may not speak English or speak it only as a second language. They may not be able to understand the significance of a document that comes. And all of those problems are avoided if the courts were to just follow the normal rule and if they had followed the normal rule here of filing, of sending these orders to Ms. Odenbaku's counsel. In this case, there was no cycling in and out. She was represented by Staten Island Legal Services the entire time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.